So good morning, everyone. Uh, um, it's a uh, pleasure to have everybody here, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, this morning's presentation and discussion. Um, we have an outstanding presentation and um, outstanding uh, follow-up conversation that I'm sure will be generated um, as a result of uh, Dr. Shaha's uh, discussion of this particular article. The, um, as, as in the past, I would encourage everyone to, um, uh, to go ahead and register questions, um, as I will be doing uh, what we've done in the past and bringing up interesting questions at the end with as much time as we have allowing. We will be going to a, um, finished exactly at nine o'clock um, so that everyone can get on with their days. So with that in mind, let me uh, just introduce very quickly um, if you would like more detailed bios, those were presented to you. But Dr. Su Susana Vargas Pinto is a, his, a bilingual Hispanic surgeon with an interest in reducing the healthcare dispar disparities amongst Latino communities in the U.S. Um, she learned her she earned her medical doctorate from Ponce School of Medicine and Health Sciences in Puerto Rico, um, and then traveled to the uh, to the U.S. Uh, where she trained in general surgery at the University of Buffalo um, and is currently completing a clinical fellowship in endocrine surgery at Yale University School of Medicine. Um, she is a member of the National Hispanic Medical Association, the, the Latino Surgical Society, and the Gold Humanism um, Honor Society. And so it's a pleasure um, to have her present. Um, and our discussant this morning really needs no introduction he is both a respected colleague and a friend. Um, he is a senior attending surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, he is widely recognized for his expertise, both as a head and neck surgeon and as a thyroid surgeon. And he has had um, an incredible career of leadership positions throughout um, both local, national, and international societies. He is a prolific author with over 600 peer reviewed articles. He's widely recognized for both his surgical expertise as well as his teaching uh, skills and his dedication um, as well as his sense of humor, which I am certainly confident will be on display this morning. So I thank you both for taking the time uh, to join us this morning and look forward to both of your presentations. Susanna? Thank you very much, Dr. Erkin. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to share our work in this wonderful platform. We will be reviewing recent studies comparing outcomes for thyroid lobectomy and total thyroidectomy for low-risk papillary thyroid cancer patients. But before we begin, we would like to see what the audience thinks about a clinical vignette. A 46-year-old female presents with a growing mass in the neck. On ultrasound, the mass is described as a single solid hypoechoic and oval-shaped nodule, wider than tall, with smooth margins. The nodule size was 2.8 times 3.2 times 1.3 millimeters in size. The patient underwent FNA biopsy that was reported as malignant Bethesda class 6. There were no other nodules identified and no apparent suspicious adenopathy in the central or lateral compartments. Based on the above characteristics and cytopathology results, which of the following will be your first choice for treatment? A, thyroid lobectomy, B, thyroid lobectomy, and possible total thyroidectomy if extrathyroidal extension is identified, C, thyroid lobectomy, and possible total thyroidectomy if a single positive node is identified, D, both B and C, and E, total thyroidectomy. So our, our poll is completed, and it looks like we've got quite a bit of uh, disparity, as the viewers can see. And we will revisit this at the end of the presentations here. OK, great. Um, so we have no disclosures um, to declare. When we initially designed our study, uh, we were looking for data supporting the adequacy of thyroid lobectomy as initial extent of surgery for papillary thyroid cancer patients um, defined as low risk by the 20, 
2015 ATA guidelines. And we found that people have been asking the same question for over 25 years now without a clear consensus, um, likely because of a lack of prospective data on outcomes following thyroid lobectomy with curative intent. Historically, total thyroidectomy was considered the standard of care for PTC over one centimeter and radioactive iodine was used as adjuvant therapy for local regional disease control. We know and it's well recognized that well-differentiated thyroid cancer is relatively indolent with most patients falling into a low risk um, category for recurrence and they tend to do well when they're treated appropriately. Um, if, in this retrospective study from MSK, for example, 75 patients over the age of 45 with well-differentiated thyroid cancer, um, tumor size under four centimeters, were clinically matched to their peers and treated with either a lobectomy or a total thyroidectomy. And the study found that there was no statistically significant differences in 20 years overall survival rates. And although the sample was very small, the local regional recurrence for lobectomy patients was no different than that for total thyroidectomy, and it was about 7%. And as you can see, this study is from 1993. More recently, in 2015, the ATA guidelines stratified well-differentiated thyroid cancer patients based on their risk for recurrence and called for consideration of thyroid lobectomy as an option for initial extent of surgery for patients classified as low risk. Specifically, these are patients who have a tumor. Um, in the text, in the guidelines, it actually describes a solitary tumor, one to four centimeters confined to the gland where there is no clinical evidence of metastasis or extrathyroidal extension and without any family history of thyroid cancer or history of external beam radiation to the head and neck. Total thyroidectomy remains the preferred treatment option for tumors over four centimeters or tumors that are under between one and four centimeters with high risk features in which the risk for recurrent structural disease exceeds 40%. The guidelines also recommend um, adjuvant radioactive iodine for intermediate risk features like aggressive histological variants, vascular invasion, or micrometastases present in more than five lymph nodes. And all of these will require a total thyroidectomy to facilitate RAI. If these intermediate features were found on the clinical specimen of patients who underwent lobectomy, they will require a completion thyroidectomy in order to have the RAI. Shortly after the publication of the 2015 ATA guidelines, um, there was concerns for the need of completion thyroidectomy on these patients because we didn't really have a lot of um, data in inferior local regional control. So people wanted to know a little bit more. Um, we aim to examine the studies that were available in the literature around the time of the publication of the guidelines in which these two outcomes um, were studied in a population of patients with classic PTC. Um, Um, we perform our, a literature search on the major databases uh, encompassing years 2012 to 2017, and we use the keywords papillary thyroid cancer, lobectomy, completion thyroidectomy, and guidelines. And we follow the PRISMA guidelines to do the systematic review. Um, our eligible studies included patients with single tumors, one to four centimeter in size, who had a diagnosis of classic papillary thyroid cancer on fine needle aspiration, and who had no evidence of extrathyroidal extension or metastatic disease, no family history of thyroid cancer or radiation to the head and neck. Um, other PTC variants, including tall cell, follicular, or indeterminate thyroid nodules were excluded from this study and studies for which the classic PTC data could be extracted were also included for analysis. Um, any studies from endemic iodine deficient areas were also excluded. Um, for initial, initially we had 274 entries, as you can see in the, I don't know if you can see that well in the diagram because it's a little small, um, but in the end, eight studies met inclusion criteria and were grouped according to the major outcomes examined, which were the estimated rates for completion thyroidectomy and the overall survival rates. 
Um, this um, figure shows the eight studies uh, that were included. And five of these studies uh, were actually theoretical estimates of completion thyroidectomy, because what happens was um, the populations underwent surgery before the actual publication of the guidelines, so everybody had a total thyroidectomy. And what most researchers did was a retrospective study to see if those patients who underwent total thyroidectomy were lobectomy candidates if the 2015 guidelines were applied. Um, Three studies compared lobectomy candidates to clinically matched patients who actually underwent um, who underwent lobectomy to total thyroidectomy. The largest of this study is the study by Adam and colleagues, um, which show that for younger patients with stage one disease, the overall survival was not significantly different when a lobectomy was performed to compared to a total thyroidectomy. Um, overall survival across these studies was, with a much smaller size, also exceeded 90%, um, despite the initial extent of surgery. Only two studies look at recurrence, um, and this was measured at seven and 10 years after the initial surgery, with a total of about 320 patients combined. Um, the most common site for recurrence was reported as the contralateral lobe, and they were managed with completion thyroidectomy. The mean local regional recurrence rates for thyroid lobectomy in this population was 5.6 for a total thyroidectomy and 5.2% for a total thyroidectomy. And the difference in the recurrent rates between these two operative approaches was not statistically significant and did not decrease overall survival. But we must also consider that the sample was small. Um, the UCLA study, uh, which is the study by Quo, it demonstrated that inexperienced hands, uh, detailed sonographic assessment of extrathyroidal extension uh, by the operative surgeon can modestly reduce the rate of total thyroidectomy in patients who are otherwise candidates for a thyroid lobectomy, um, but that it's very dependent on surgeon's expertise. Um, in this next figure, um, it presents the proportion of patients who underwent total thyroidectomy and would be eligible for a thyroid lobectomy as the initial operation. Um, the rates varied among study cohorts, but it represented less than 40% of all papillary thyroid cancer patients. Um, with the exception of the study from the Pittsburgh group by Deere, um, they have a higher proportion of candidates for a lobectomy as primary surgery. Across all studies, uh, the major indications identified for completion thyroidectomy were the prevalence of intermediate or high-risk histological features requiring um, administration of adjuvant radioactive iodine. And completion thyroidectomies for classic PTC um, varied from 20 to 43% per study with a mean of 34%. And in this figure, um, in terms of the high-risk histological features that were found in surgical specimens, microscopic extrathyroidal extension, vascular invasion, and cervical nodal metastasis were present in all cohorts with varying frequencies. Multifocal tumors were present in most of the cohorts, and only high-risk histological feature, the only high-risk histological feature, which was identified as an independent risk factor associated with incomplete treatment response, was lymphovascular invasion. The study by Deere et al., which is the Pittsburgh group, they reported a significantly higher prevalence of microscopic extrathyroidal extension um, about present in 89% of their specimens. Uh, multifocal tumors were present in 57% and cervical metastasis was present in 58% in their low-risk PTC patients, um, which is significantly higher compared to other study groups. Their study cohort also carried a high prevalence of genetic mutations, including 
uh, BRAF B600E mutations and RETS PTC rearrangements, which are associated with a fourfold increase in the risk of actually having intermediate risk disease, according to the ATA guidelines. So this may be partial explanations um, why they had higher um, rates for completion thyroidectomies. Um, in summary, we found no difference in overall survival between lobectomy or total thyroidectomy for patients with low-risk classic papillary thyroid cancer, as defined by the 2015 ATA guidelines. Um, however, up to one-third of the patients undergoing a lobectomy may require a completion thyroidectomy because of aggressive histology uh, found on the surgical specimen. Uh, we think that as clinicians continue to adopt the guidelines and the most recent AJCC staging system, the estimated rates may drop significantly if the relative indications for radioactive iodine, like incidental positive lymph nodes or microscopic positive margins, um, are excluded. Um, however, lobectomy candidates need to be counseled regarding the risk for a second surgery. Uh, for recurrence and a surveillance strategy because de-escalation of cancer surgery may not be the optimal option for some patients for a variety of reasons. Um, ultimately, the treatment plan, it's going to be a shared decision process between the patient, the surgeon, and the endocrinologist, and the rates of a completion thyroidectomy will not be as important as the availability of resources for preoperative stratification, the patient's preference or how the patient feels about the type of surgery that it's offered to them and the institutional protocols regarding radioactive iodine indications. Um, finally, in this study, the population size and the number of events is too small to support a conclusion in regards to recurrence following thyroid lobectomy, but our findings are consistent with previous studies reporting that the contralateral lobe is the most common site of local regional recurrence and that recurrences can be successfully managed in these patients with a completion thyroidectomy. Um, and these are our selected references. Uh, go right ahead, Dr. Shaha. Okay, I, um, Mark, can you hear me? I sure can. Okay, great, perfect. So let me just start by saying, Susanna, you did a great job. It was a great study. I admire your uh, review of the extensive literature. The problem is we start with uh, 274 studies and then we come down to only eight studies. So I'm not going to say there is a bias, but you got to realize there is an inherent bias between the publications and selection of the of the reviews. So just keep that in mind for the sake of the audience. Now, what is the take home message? What is the take home message in this? The take home message is the local regional recurrence is only six percent. Um, OK, so you may need to reduce the microphone level. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, no. um, okay, let me just go away from a little bit. Can you hear me better now? Absolutely fine. Okay, fine. So I just need to go away from them. So the, the message from this uh, manuscript is the local regional recurrence is only 6%. Now, if you look at the Discussion, they have mentioned that the completion thyroidectomy would be recommended in 34% of the patients. But that is fallacious because now we know that the completion thyroidectomy is performed only for high risk features. And minor extrathyroid extension or positive margins are not high risk features. And if we exclude those, the risk of requiring a total thyroidectomy is only 11%. So I think this is the basic thing that we need to realize. Can, uh, can you see my slide? Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'm going to discuss the age-old controversy that is going on for last 100 years. 
we've been fighting about it. There has been a lot of animosity between surgeons and surgeons. There has been a lot of disagreement between surgeon and endocrinologists. And many endocrinologists have stopped sending patients to us because we firmly believe in lobectomy. But what you need to realize is we believe in lobectomy only because that's the biologically best surgical procedure. And as you know very well, when things ceases to be a subject of controversy, it ceases to be a subject of interest. So you've got to keep the controversy on. So why there is a debate? Why we are arguing about it? The reason is very simple. The results are equally good whether you do a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. And I think this is very important to realize. And we learned that in the breast cancer very easily. Lumpectomy or mastectomy, the outcome was the same. However, in the breast, we switch quite a bit. In thyroid, we're not ready to switch immediately. Most of the patients present with low-risk cancer. Now, what is another important thing is at one time, there was one-size-fits philosophy, total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine. I think in the last 20 years, we have realized that the adjuvant therapy in the form of radioactive iodine is, has very little implication or impact on the long-term survival or recurrence. So if you look at the current data, there is less and less interest in giving adjuvant therapy. That means we don't need to take out the other side to facilitate giving the radioactive iodine. The complication rate is higher. The bigger the operation, the higher the complications. And all of you in the surgical world will recognize the complications from thyroid surgery are probably much worse than the disease itself, the nerve injury, permanent hypoparathyroidism. Unfortunately, there are no randomized prospective trials in thyroid. So you're not going to get level one evidence. We have to go with the retrospective data. The problem with the retrospective data is there is a lot of bias, a lot of misunderstanding, and the entry points are very different. And what we need to learn is the biology of thyroid cancer. And we have been doing this. We have been a firm believer in lobectomy for the past 40 years. Keep in mind, only 20% of you will remember 20% of what we said 20 minutes after the lecture. So the next Zoom meeting, you would have forgotten everything we have said. The purpose of modern day treatment philosophy is to use the cost effective, evidence based, and use the best resource utilization. Don't use hammer and nail philosophy. And what is important to realize that there has been enormous over-treatment and obviously treatment-related complications. This is a very important slide. I've made this many, many years back, but I'm going to repeat it showing age is the most important prognostic factor. Age 55, which is now the cutoff, when I became 48, we switched from 45 to 55. So you can see that we have changed our philosophy of management of thyroid cancer. In the younger people below the age of 55, there is no stage three and four cancer. This is the only human cancer where is age is included in the prognostic features. Multicentricity has no meaning. Um, microscopic tumor is seen in about 10% of the American population. What is what we call as laboratory cancer again has no implication and the next most important is the nodal metastasis the minor nodal metastasis one two or three with minor focus of metastatic disease has no impact you take any other cancer the tongue cancer the larynx cancer uh, uh, the nodal metastasis has a major impact but not in thyroid cancer so many years back we came up with this logo the good bad and ugly. I'm just going to make it very simple. Uh, the philosophy of good, bad and ugly that we have promulgated at Memorial starting from 1970s is now picked up by the ATA uh, guidelines in the low, intermediate and high risk group. So what is the low risk group? The young patient with small tumors. What is the outcome? 99 to 100%. What is the intermediate risk group? Young patient with bad tumor or old patient with good tumor? What is the high risk? Older patient above the age of 55. This is uh, 45 is now switched to 55. Or larger tumor or poor histology. You can see here the survival drops in that group 
quite a bit. In the low and intermediate risk group, the survival is excellent. Now, if, if I can summarize the selection of therapy, in the low risk group, lobectomy is enough. In the intermediate risk group, you make the discretion based on aggressiveness of the tumor. In the high risk group, there is absolutely no doubt. This is a group where the mortality is counted in thyroid cancer. We never talk about mortality in the low risk group. We do talk about mortality in the high risk group because it is almost 25 to 30 percent uh, mortality in this group. Now, the age old controversy that we have been talking lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. This is the data that we publish in Anal Subsurgical Oncology. And you will see here 400 patients, whether you do a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy, the outcome is all identical. 99 to 100% uh, um, survival. We always make a mention that when these patients come back for follow-up on a regular basis, they are more likely to get hit by a taxi in New York City than thyroid cancer. This is one of the, uh, I would say, a lead statement in the management of thyroid cancer. And one of the common arguments for total thyroidectomy is, I don't have complications, I can do it. What's the big deal? The fact that you can do a total thyroidectomy safely does not mean it is indicated in all patients with thyroid cancer. An operation not worth doing is not worth doing well. We never talk about total glossectomy. We don't talk about total laryngectomy, total colectomy. We like to debate in thyroid about total versus less than total thyroidectomy because outcome is the same. Remember, the when we talk about the statistics, the first law of statistics is if the statistics don't support your viewpoint, you need more statistics. And the second law is given enough statistics, you can prove anything. I can go on either side. It doesn't matter. I don't think it makes a difference what you do exactly. What are the principles? I just want to go to the last two points. The cost effective and evidence based management. That's the most important. And next one is avoid over treatment and treatment related surgical and medical complications. Now, the next two slides are very important. I made them specifically to understand what is our responsibility as a surgeon. We need to define what is a truly low risk cancer. Unfortunately, the ATA guidelines describe less than four centimeters. I don't think that they, they have gone into the details of preoperative evaluation. Let's go through some preoperative evaluation. Tumor less than four centimeters. If it is a hard and fixed tumor, that's bad. It may be three centimeter, but it is hard and fixed, not good. Radiological finding like irregular tumor, high incidence of nodal metastasis. Make sure that the opposite side is studied very well, very important. If there are nodules on the other side, which are more than five centimeters, five millimeters, I would either do the biopsy or consider total thyroidectomy. Make sure the lymph nodes are evaluated carefully, both with a good ultrasound and quite often CT scan. I think the CT scan for preoperative evaluation in thyroid has been underused. As a surgeon, I like the CT scan to evaluate the paratracheal lymph nodes, the superior mediastinal lymph nodes, lateral neck nodes, and retropharyngeal nodes. And the last very important, it's a triangle of management of thyroid cancer. One end of the triangle is the patient. The other end is the endocrinologist who is going to follow the patient. And the third end is a surgeon. This triangle must be complete. If it is not complete, the patients are going to get confused. The worst thing I do is I do a lobectomy. Patient goes to his own endocrinologist and the endocrinologist says, this is a wrong treatment. You need radioactive iodine and you need to go and get completion thyroidectomy. What is in the operating room? Once we are in the operating room, always consent for possible total thyroidectomy. Because we may change the mind in the operating room if there is a gross extra thyroid extension. I have a strong philosophy, and this may be much different than other surgeons. In a proven or suspected thyroid cancer, I always like to take the sternothyroid muscle. 
the sternothyroid muscle reacts on the thyroid. And if you take that, the, the concern that you have positive margin or minor extrathyroid extension, you don't have to worry about it because you did the best cancer operation. Look for the delphian node, the paratracheal node, get a frozen section. Now, one or two lymph nodes don't push you for total thyroidectomy. But if there are a bundle of suspicious lymph nodes, then I would definitely consider total thyroidectomy. Now, I just want to give you some data. Again, you cannot give a talk without data. This is the data from Memorial. Ian Nixon and our group did the study. When we looked at the thyroid lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy, the conclusion is in T1 and T2, well differentiated thyroid cancer managed by thyroid lobectomy or total thyroidectomy, there was no difference. This is another paper. This is a CR data, large database, almost 40,000 patients. I had an opportunity to write an editorial on this. And this was in contrast to the first Bilimoria paper, which came out strongly recommending total thyroidectomy. This is from Mendelssohn. Again, there was no difference. Now, this is interesting. This study was already shown by Susanna. Bilimoria paper came from NCDB. National Cancer Database, some 60,000 patients. When that study came out, the ATA jumped on that and said total thyroidectomy is the most important treatment. When that study was redone more critically, analyzing critically the, the in between the lines and the data was reanalyzed, it was concluded that there was no difference in lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. Very interesting. I think this is a take-home message. Don't look at the large database unless there is a true authenticity. And there is a decision-making or an aim of the study. And I think this is a very classical example. Two papers at an interval of about five years contradicting each other as to the conclusions. Now, this is a summary slide of the ATA guidelines. We are all familiar with this. Uh, in the low-risk group, Total thyroidectomy is recommended for tumors more than 4 cm or gross extrathyroid extension. And again, ATA switch to lobectomy. This is a major switch for ATA because they are dominated by endocrinologists. But what has happened in the last two decades is the endocrinologists have realized and understood the impact of radioactive iodine, which is very minimal in the low-risk cancer. This is one of the nice editorial on ATA guidelines. Lace is more from Kim et al. And I think this is very interesting to read this. If you look at our own data for intrathyroidal tumors, whether we did a lobectomy or total thyroidectomy, you can see the local recurrence, the distant disease, the neck recurrence, disease-specific survival. There was no difference in the entire group. Uh, this is the ADAM data that we just talked about. They looked at a large number of patients, 61,000 patients, lobectomy or total thyroidectomy, no outcome difference. And I'm, I cannot stop showing this slide. Let the punishment fit the crime. I think this is the statement that came from Blake Cady, and we have been using the same philosophy, I would say, for the last 50 years at Sloan Catering. Keep in mind the complications of thyroid surgery are directly proportional to the extent of thyroidectomy and inversely proportional to the experience of the operating surgeon. Good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. And once you get into thyroid complications, like a young girl with nerve injury, or a permanent hypoparathyroidism, you become the most humble surgeon in the world, because you feel you have ruined that girl's life for the rest of her life. The good philosophy um, the 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 um, this is the statement from uh, William Osler. A good physician treats the disease, but a great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And when it comes to thyroid cancer, it's not lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. It's managing the entire patient in total in relation to the outcome, long-term survival, and what will happen to that patient in future. A conservative approach is not to treat all tumors by limited operation. But what is important is to tailor the extent of the procedure based on biological characteristics 
prognostic factors and risk group analysis. I think ATA has taken a very good stand on the low intermediate and high risk definition of thyroid cancer based on biology of thyroid cancer. Now I'm just going to conclude in a couple of minutes. This is one of the commonest problem we see around the world. Patient goes for lobectomy, the frozen section is follicular neoplasm or benign, the permanent comes malignant. There is a knee jerk reflux in the United States to take this patient back to the operating room for completion thyroidectomy. Now some 30 years back, before most of you were born, definitely before Mark was born, I wrote this paper for surgery from uh, American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. The extent of thyroidectomy should be determined based on a variety of factors. Pre-op needle biopsy. If you decide to do the frozen section, what are the prognostic factors? The ages, the aims, the memorial prognostic factors, the risk group analysis, the clinical findings at the time of surgery. Look at this. 30 years back, we wrote about it. The clinical findings, gross extracellular extension, unilateral or bilateral disease, uh, um, multiple lymph node metastasis. This has not changed at memorial, but around the world, the philosophy has changed quite a bit. Always there are some issues and concerns about lobectomy. Uh, is, it, is the disease unilateral or bilateral? That's the most important. What is the size of the tumor? What are the ultrasound findings? Oncologic safety, complications. And the last, which is very important, is the quality of life. I don't think there are very good studies on quality of life between lobectomy or total thyroidectomy. Keep in mind, God gave an organ to us to have a normal function, endocrine function. You rip it out or take it out, and the patient leaves on thyroid medication, probably the patient leaves normal life, but I can assure you that is not the same quality of life. I do hope in last 16, 17 minutes, I have not confused you, but if I have confused you, I'm going to summarize saying, the management of thyroid cancer is not one person decision. It's the understanding between the surgeon, the endocrinologist, the nuclear physician, and don't forget the complications, the institutional philosophy, and the last but not the least, the Google search. It is not Dr. Shaha or Dr. Arkan taking a, uh, care of the patient. It's Dr. Google taking care of the patient. And it's very important, Professor Google directs the patient properly. Unfortunately, many patients read Google literature and come and ask for total thyroidectomy. If you want to summarize the good, bad, and ugly, the survival, you can see the difference. If we want to be aggressive, let's be very aggressive in this group, ugly and high risk group. Here you make individual decisions in the good risk. I think the patients do remarkably well. I just want to summarize this statement because this is probably the most important statement in thyroid cancer made by Richard Siemens. There are two sides to the coin all the time. Commonplace clinical problems, lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy are approached in a diametrically opposite ways by surgeons with a similar training background. We're all trained in the same way, but what do we do? We interpret available information differently based on unique personal experience, vision, and the most important thing in surgery is surgical prejudice, or what I like to call surgical ego. It is that ego which brings us to the debate and the controversy. Keep in mind, total thyroidectomy is one-way traffic. You can come back once you take the thyroid out. Lobectomy is a two-way traffic. You can always make a U-turn and find the best solution. You can always take it out, but you can't put it back in. You don't need AK-47 to kill the mouse. Low-risk thyroid cancer is a small mouse. You don't need AK-47. You don't need an elephant to kill the ant. These are my own philosophies, but this is very important. There are three stages in the life of a surgeon. The first 10 years, you learn how to operate. The next 10 years, you learn when to operate. And the most important stage in the life of a surgeon is the last 10 years when you learn when not to operate. And there is a fourth stage, which I'm not going to put on the slide, when to send the patient to my good friend, 
Dr. Mark Arkan. This is our multidisciplinary group. You can see here many surgeons involved and our endocrinologist who works with us and we have developed a common philosophy. A tip for the surgeons, always in, invite an endocrinologist for drinks and dinner. This is very important to keep in mind. And if you have any further questions, feel free to call me on this number. My 800 number is very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shaha. We are going to open this poll up and just see if our findings, if our audience is going to respond differently. So if you could be, um, go ahead and respond to this poll, um, we will compare how people viewed this uh, question at the beginning versus now. There are a number of questions that I would like to get to in just a moment um, as soon as we finish up this poll. Terrific. So it looks if I um, have a breakdown of the this, it looks like our poll did not change significantly, that there's at least half of the people are um, going to base decisions regarding the extent of thyroidectomy on intraoperative findings. And I think some of this is um, does represent a nuance in surgical experience um, as to how best to uh, gauge the extent of um, extra thyroidal extension. I think it's very interesting that Dr. Shaha does harvest the or uh, remove the sternothyroid muscle. Um, in I, I assume you're doing that in all patients, Ashok? Uh, or suspected thyroid cancer. Uh, if I do the multinodal goiter, I don't worry about it. But in a right. large follicular neoplasm, or a suspected cancer, I like to take sternothyroid. Sternothyroid has no uh, major functionality. It gives a better exposure to the thyroid, and it also gives better exposure to the upper pole. So I take it, and when the final report comes back as minor extracellular extension or perithyroid adipose tissue involvement, I don't feel uncomfortable. I feel very good that I did the best operation. Right. So I think one of the real challenges comes with intraoperative decision making. I think we can all um, make determinations on the extent of, um, of thyroid surgery for biopsy proven papillary thyroid carcinoma or follicular thyroid carcinoma based on what we know going into the procedure. The real challenge for me comes with interpreting information intraoperatively. And so one of the questions I will put out there is, what drives your decision intraoperatively and how much do you rely upon frozen section? And so, you know, I think it's, um, do you live and die by the rule of five positive nodes that are identified on frozen section and based on the size? Do you get that granular um, in your frozen section analysis to, in order to make that decision? Let me, let me start with that. Um, you want me to respond, Mark, or you want to wait for Susanna? Um, so either one, uh, Susanna okay. or Asha, go ahead. Let, let me respond to it because I think this is one of the important points. And unfortunately, this, is, this cannot be written in a textbook. It has to come from learning from your mentors or being in the operating room and the operating surgeon making a discussion. Now, finding one or two positive notes or a granularity of the decision making has very little meaning. Finding one or two positive nodes is a commonality in thyroid cancer. What I tell the patient and the family is, are that bundle of lymph nodes. When I go in, my responsibility first is to look at the paratracheal area, look at the superior mediastinal area, level six and so seven. And if there is a glob of lymph nodes or a hard lymph nodes, large lymph nodes, I would do a total thyroidectomy. Now, finding one or two positive nodes is no surprise. Does the frozen section help? Yes, the frozen section helps if there are a bundle of lymph nodes. If there is one or two positive nodes and they're not very uh, uh, bothering me much, all that I will do is clean up the level six and seven and not do anything more. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a very strong philosophy and we have written a few papers on Delphian node. If the tumor is in the lateral lobe and the Delphian node is positive, that is, 
probably likely there are more paratracheal lymph nodes and I would spend more time looking at the level six and seven. So I look at the Delphian node as a probably most concerning node to make a decision in the operating room unless the tumor is in the isthmus where Delphian nodes are common. But considering that the tumor is not in the isthmus, I look at the Delphian node very critically. So let me um, let me get to the issue of multifocality. Um, and because you know this is not uncommon. Um, so let's let's assume that you have the scenario where you have a nodule in the contralateral lobe that may or may not have been biopsied by virtue of the fact that um, maybe it was less than a centimeter, looked fairly innocent on um, ultrasonography, um, and just wasn't biopsied. Let me start with the question: Do you will you um, biopsy? less than a centimeter nodule on the contralateral lobe um, if you are otherwise thinking that you would perform a, a thyroid lobectomy um, in a particular patient with biopsy proven disease? That's a great question, Mark. And this is one of the commonest problem or, contra, or, or a, a concern that comes up in the operating room. Let me make it very simple. If the nodule on the other side is more than five millimeter and the end, uh, the sonographer feels comfortable to do the biopsy, I would do the biopsy. And I'll tell you why. The patient needs to know that there is a tiny nodule on the other side, which would require monitoring for the rest of his or her life. Let's say you're dealing with a 30 year old patient. He or she needs to know that there is a tiny nodule which will be monitored and they feel more comfortable if we tell them in advance that this nodule is not suspicious by needle biopsy. Now, you and me are comfortable looking at the ultrasound and saying this is benign, but patients are not. And the worst thing that happens is we take out one lobe, this nodule grows in the next three years, we operate on the patient and there is a cancer on the other side. Now, if the nodule is below five millimeters, I don't have great faith because I don't think we can get a good biopsy. But if the nodule is more than a, a five millimeter, if it is more than two centimeter, I would probably do total thyroidectomy, knowing very well that nodule will grow in future and will bring the patient back to the operating room. So that's my philosophy. Yeah. And I can um, go ahead, Susan. If if I can interject, um, in a similar in a similar way um, at Yale. We routinely offer lobectomies to patients who do not have contralateral nodules on the um, on the sonogram. Uh, we have a very good and reliable sonographer that does most of our ultrasounds uh, before the surgery, and they feel very comfortable biopsying nodules that are under one centimeter if that is the case. Uh, we will also biopsy if there's a contralateral nodule that is under one centimeter. Uh, but we tend to offer total thyroidectomy if there is a nodule that it's about 1.5 centimeters on the contralateral side. Good point. And, great. And how, before I get to the questions from the uh, um, attendees here, how does the identification of multifocality within the ipsilateral lobe impact your, your surgical okay. decision making? Uh, that's a great, great question. I just wrote an editorial. If you put my name in the PubMed, you'll find it in the European Journal. Um, multifocality, again, I'm going to make very common statements. Multifocality is a commonality in the thyroid. So finding multifocal cancer on one side does not push me to do a completion thyroidectomy as long as the opposite lobe is normal by sonogram. Yep. Remember, 10% of the American population, including 10% of the audience, has microscopic thyroid cancer. So the multifocality is equivalent to microscopic cancer on the other side. If we could monitor that, something becomes obvious, you can always go back and take out the other side. Right. So let me get make sure that I get to some of these um, uh, questions. Dr. Um, Brandwine has raised the question of um, the opinion regarding age not being included in the ATA's risk of recurrence uh, classification. Do you want to comment on that? And, and let me just, as a brief aside, I always wondered why 
um, what the data was supporting the decision to change 45 to 55, and I appreciate that your your turning 46 was the motivation <laughs> to change that. But thank you for your clarification on that. Um, it makes perfect sense now. Um, um, that's, that's a great question. Um, if you look at the data uh, uh, publication, uh, I'm one of the co-authors that came from Ian Nixon, our uh, uh, fellow when he was here. Um, and he looked at the data from many institutions, uh, ours, MD Anderson, um, University of Toronto, uh, and uh, uh, Australia. Uh, they came to the conclusions and they did the whole analysis uh, with the Sur kaplan meyer survival curve. There was no difference up to 55. And that's why the age 45 was raised to 55. Now, if you go to the granularity of this data, there are some concerns here uh, because let's say you have a 54 year old patient with seven centimeter thyroid cancer. We're going to call it stage one because that's the way we look at it. But in reality, it is not stage one. It's pretty advanced cancer. So there is some, you know, fallacy about this, but the age distinction is very uh, 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 critical that up to 55, there is no survival difference. The mortality does not change between 45 and 55. So that's why it was used. This was the data from many institutions. This has been referenced in the ATA guidelines. And again, uh, we have published a couple of papers on this uh, with the age of changing to 55. I think Dr. Bramwine's specific question is related to inclusion of age in risk of recurrence. Um, I, I don't think I got the question. Can you make it clear? Yeah, yeah sorry. So the question from Dr. Bramwine really relates to why age is not um, cut off of 55 is not included in the ATA risk stratification for risk of recurrence. Um, I, I'm not sure. You know, I let. I think uh, you know they they have included that. Uh, I, I I know, I know. The reason is the ATA looks at it a little different, low intermediate and high risk group. And you are right, Dr. Brenda, when you are correct, they have not emphasized so much on the on the um, age. Uh, while, while if you look at the NCCN guidelines or if you look at the, the staging system, they have emphasized quite a bit the, the low intermediate and high risk group. Actually, there is a very nice paper which was published by our group uh, with uh, Mike Tuttle as a senior author, integrating the ATA risk stratification and the, the AJCC staging. And I think integration of these two groups is very important because you are absolutely right. The ATA looks at a low intermediate and high risk group, while the AJCC looks, uh, uses age as a cutoff. If you integrate that, you will have a better uh, classification of thyroid cancer. This was published in thyroid, I would say, about a year back. Great. Um, yes, that's, that certainly is a, a, a fascinating idea. I suspect that in the next five years, we will likely see that. I want to get to Dr. Um, Mac Harrell's uh, comment here. He says, um, we often see four, greater than four centimeter encapsulated follicular lineage cancers without distant metastases that behave nicely after lobectomy. When is the ATA going to recognize this in their guidelines? Um, I think they have already done so, you know, that the this is again the low risk thyroid cancer, minimal capsular invasion. Um, uh, I think they, if, if, again, you know, they, the current guidelines are like so many pages, more than 100 pages. But I have read them a couple of times. I think they have included this as a low risk thyroid cancer. We divide follicular cancers into low risk, low, uh, minimally invasive and widely invasive. This is what we learned long time back from Juan Rosai that minimally invasive, the survival is 99 to 100%. There was a paper published from Mayo Clinic by John Van Eerden uh, about 30 years back. The low risk, minimally invasive thyroid cancer is a low risk, low, minimally threatening thyroid cancer. And they do very well with lobectomy alone. 
great. So I think there's one question here from uh, Dr. Binstam uh, regarding the presence of semoma bodies um, involving thyroid per, um, parenchyma uh, within um, presumably suggesting in transit lymphatic involvement. Would that influence your decision making, presumably uh, to perform a completion thyroidectomy? Um, again, the answer is no. I think recently we faced with this. Uh, the outside institution called it multifocal intralymphatic uh, metastasis, while the memorial reported that as multifocal samoma bodies. Yes, again, let's just go back. That there is, if there are multiple samoma bodies or intralymphatic spread on one side, it is quite likely there is a small microscopic disease on the other side. Again, go back to the philosophy. 10% of the Americans have this disease. Unless there is anything clinically or radiologically apparent, I don't think there is any strong indication to go back and do a completion thyroidectomy and give radioactive iodine. The survival in this group is 99%. The recurrence is about 3%. Terrific. And let me um, just get at a, one last question here related to identification of high risk um, uh, um, mutation analysis that is identified on preoperative fine needle aspiration cytology. In your mind and your surgical decision making, which, um, which takes priority? The findings the finding of that of those adverse um, um, molecular findings or the um, phenotype that is identified on histology would uh, would do you understand the question? Yes, I do. Uh, this is one of the commonest questions we face now because more and more molecular testings are done. Uh, let me make it very simple. The decision about the low risk, intermediate risk, high risk is clinical judgment based on the clinical findings, ultrasound findings. This is not used, uh, uh, this stratification does not use BRAP or any other mutation at this point. Uh, we need more data to, to prove that the BRAP is truly a very aggressive cancer with long-term outcome or mortal, high mortality. Again, if you look at the intrathyroidal tumor, I don't think it makes any difference whether it is BRAF positive. Now, somebody will ask me, BRAF and TERT together, is it bad? I don't know. Probably yes. Would that push me to do a completion thyroidectomy? Today, no, because I would still use the clinical factors, except I would monitor this patient more critically. Remember, the BRAF guru came to memorial from Cincinnati. Jim Fagan was our chief of endocrine. And he, in our discussion, we never used BRAF as a decision maker. I know at Hopkins and other places, they use it for a while. When Zing was there, he used it. But now, again, they have gone back to the philosophy that it does not make any difference. The clinical features are very important. Also, remember, most of the BRAF positive are older people, larger tumors, which will push you into total thyroidectomy and the BRAF itself. But BRAF and TERT, maybe I'll be a little more pushy. I don't have a right answer for that question. Okay, terrific. Hey, this has been a fascinating discussion on a, a very interesting and a very important topic. Um, I appreciate um, Susanna's presentation, Ashok's presentation and discussion. Um, I speak for our audience in thanking you for your time and effort here. And um, everybody, as I uh, say every week, stay safe and um, look forward to next week's discussion. So thank you very much.